The Silicon Valley Tech Talk Lounge is a show where we invite guests working here in the Bay Area to talk about their work, its impact, and their insights on current news and events. In today's episode, our guest is Mr. Christopher Kuzmo. Mr. Kuzmo is currently a computer science teacher at Palo Alto High School. Sounds good. And yeah. so I just want to give a, a quick introduction of you before we start the show. And okay. um, uh, our guest today is Mr. Chris Kuzmo. Mr. Kuzmo holds a computer science degree and a computer science and engineering degree from uh, MIT and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He wrote some of the earliest code for internet search and image processing on high performance computers and has worked for startup companies in areas of parallel computing network routing, digital transaction security, and deep web page analysis. Mr. Kuzmo began teaching at Pali in 2009 and has mentored or taught more than a dozen world champions in the area of robotics, mathematical modeling, leadership, and pure mathematics. He served as president at a Kiwanese chapter. Did I pronounce that correctly? Kiwanis. 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 Okay. Sorry. Kiwanis chapter PTA and a chapter of Computer Science Teachers Association. He has also served on the CSTA National Standards Committee. Mr. Kuzmo pioneered the Stanford Formal Logic Curriculum at the uh, secondary level and created and taught the first professional level uh, development seminars in formal logic at Stanford AI Lab and Stanford's Center for Excellence in Teaching. Through the Microsoft TOS program, Mr. Kuzmo led more than a dozen high school students, uh, uh, more than two dozen high schools across the state of Washington in delivering computer science. This included a substantial remote instruction program. He has presented, inspected, and judged for FIRST Robotics at the regional and national level and is expected to join the Webster Rob uh, Regional Robotics Forum Board of Directors in June 2020. Currently, uh, Mr. Kuzmo is my APCS teacher at Palo Alto High School. Um, so I guess a good starting point um, would be just um, we talk a little bit about your work prior to coming to Pali. And I was wondering if you could go a little bit more in depth with what you did. Um, well, so I've, I've kind of, uh, someone my age has had multiple lives, um, but um, I, when I graduated from college back in the 80s, I uh, went and worked for what's called a Beltway Bandit in, just outside of Washington, D.C., um, and that's a company that uh, fulfills contracts for the U.S. government. Uh, in this case, it was for sort of technical oversight of, uh, of major endeavors that were were were, were pursued by the, the government, um, uh, such as launching satellites and launching uh, uh, any kind of spacecraft to go uh, well anywhere. Um, and so uh, there there were the, the the breadth of technical knowledge at that particular company. It's a small company. It's about uh, one or two hundred people. Uh, but amongst them, there was the expertise to basically put a person on the moon. Um, and so it was a great learning experience for me. Um, and then from there, I, I, uh, my, my, I had a girlfriend who was a, a student at MIT, and she got into graduate school at Stanford. And so I came out to, to Silicon Valley and worked for a startup company for a couple of years. Um, and like most startup companies, that failed. And uh, then the uh, um, so, so so then things got a little bit confused uh, or a little bit a little bit varied because I I uh, went uh, I, I went I went kind of simultaneously went to work for NASA went to uh, graduate school at the University of Illinois and, and went to the former Soviet Union uh, uh, when my wife became a Fulbright lecturer. Um, 
and uh, the uh, and, and, and so so I spent some time in the former Soviet Union where I got most of my stories, um, and that was my good stories. And then from there, I came back and worked for NASA for several more years, basically the rest of the '90s, and wrote to be a senior research scientist for the contracting company whose name was Computer Sciences Corporation. Um, and around the year 2000, more or less 2001, uh, uh, went to work for another startup company, which also failed. These things happen. Basically, that's what startup companies do almost always is fail. Um, but that was sort of a, a, a transitional opportunity for our family because then my wife, uh, when that startup company failed, my wife, we decided we agreed that my wife would work full time uh, and I would take care of the kids. Um, and uh, that caused me to focus my attention on the community and the schools. And that's sort of where I, I became a PTA president for a couple of years when there's all kinds of stories from that time. And I was a Kiwanis Club chapter president. Um, and I finally decided after being involved with the schools and the community, as a volunteer and as a parent, as as sort of a leader of of nonprofits and that sort of thing, that the thing to do is to actually become a teacher. And so I kind of finally bit the bullet around 2008 and started doing the things you have to do to get credentialed. And in late 2009, I became a credentialed teacher. Um, maybe too early 2010, something around 2009 or 10. Um, I'm not sure what the actual date is on the official documents. Um, and then. Uh, from from that point forward, I was a professional full-time teacher, um, and the vast majority of that in teaching at Pali, uh, and teaching in more or less the role that I'm in now. Okay, and all of the works of you've um, the that you were in, you were primarily focused on the software side of uh, side of things. I would say that's accurate. Yeah, yeah, and. So something I'm I'm quite curious about is, uh, you said that you worked in a lot of the companies that uh, a lot of the startups um, that current that that ended up failing, and you wrote some of the earliest codes for things like, uh, for many of the things that we take for granted today, like, uh, you said parallel computing, network routing, digital transaction security, and deep web page analysis. And yeah. if you look at, if you try to, if you kind of compare the level of uh, sophistication of those technologies now and how complex they are or how, how much they have changed, do you feel that there's a huge change between now and when, when, the, when, when it was first successfully developed? Well, complexity comes in different forms. Um, and so the... There are refinements that make it so that uh, something that works as a sort of a research project um, I think we are losing a bit of connection here Let's see the, now now I would say there's a lot of, a lot more sort of standard processes for how to how to create a a piece of software that that will robustness, um, uh -huh. and which can involve the work of of more than one person. In other words, working groups. Things like the, the the concepts behind GitHub, for example, uh, are uh, ten years ago. It was uncommon for even industry stand, industry professionals to be that familiar with. It. I mean, at that point, they did twenty years ago. It was uncommon, and you certainly 20 years ago wouldn't have even thought of having students using GitHub. 10 years ago, it was novel for have stu students using GitHub. Now, okay. everyone uses GitHub, yeah. um, uh -huh. and so that's just one example uh, of of uh, of an increasing level of understanding and literacy throughout the population for how to use a particular technology that, in turn, makes it so that the software that you produce is more is more mature earlier uh, and it can and, and and can be developed by more people um, so I would say that that's the main the main source of, of increased sophistication but that's but 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 the the complexity in terms of how hard did you have to think about solving a problem you had to think harder in some ways 
back in 1990 uh, because there weren't any of these tools or concepts at your disposal. You had to come up with them on your own. And for start, uh, startups nowadays, do you feel that they've kind of moved on to newer fields or have they been both moving on to newer fields, but at the same time refining the ones that of uh, that that you've worked on, was it like 20, um, 30 years, thirty to forty years ago, right? Uh, well, oh, no. yeah, I mean, so 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 the first startup I worked for, I worked for in nineteen eighty eight, which is what thirty two years ago, and the last startup that I personally have worked for was in two thousand and six, which was still fourteen years ago. Um, now, I've also seen colleagues and students and my son all work for startup companies uh, in that 14-year time. Um, it's a slightly different perspective, uh, but I still think I have an idea of how, the, how these things have changed. And I would say that um, a couple of the things, so, so one of the fun facts from 1988 was when you started a startup company and if you told an investor that you were your startup company was focusing on software, they wouldn't give you nearly as much financing. They wouldn't be nearly as confident in your, your business as if you were saying that you were actually going to build a physical piece of hardware, a, a, a physical computer, for example. That was, uh, so, so, so that was uh, something which even then you could tell was gonna change, but for the people who were the leaders of the company who were at the time were in their were 50s or 60s, people that, that were at that time my age now, uh, and I was more like your age, a little older, but basically your age. Uh -huh. uh, and so in 1988, I was like, come on, software is going to be the thing. And, and, uh, but, they, but they were like, we can't get money to develop software. We have to develop hardware. Um, and so that's completely different now. Um, so that now, of course, if you're, if you're building an app, and it's promising, then you can get financing for it. Um, and if you're building hardware, people are looking at it sketchily, like, wait a minute, are you going to be able to afford to do support the, the development costs for hardware uh, right. and, yeah. and be able to overcome the fact that that can be rapidly, you, the competition can, can rapidly outsource the hardware out of, out of the country and make it so that you, your business is undermined by that. Yeah. Um, so it's that, that particular concept has been sort of turned around. There's other issues of how, how start, start, startup companies are, are managed and led um, that's changed a little bit, but not that much, I don't think. Yeah, the thing with uh, software is that it could be infinitely produced without increasing or, or even slightly increasing the cost because it's so easy to just duplicate the software over and over again and hardware costs a lot more to produce yeah yeah there is the, the margins for software are fantastic uh i think in both whether you're talking about in 1988 or you're talking about now the rationale for the valuation was more in terms of what could a competitor do and so in 1988 people thought well that you could just your competitor can just copy your software right mm -hmm. now the protection, the, lead, the intellectual property protections for software are more well established. They're not perfect, but, 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 but people know what they are, right? So that it's less likely someone will just steal your software willy nilly. And meanwhile, the capacity to, to outsource uh, or otherwise automate the creation of hardware now is much, much easier than it was then. So it's all about what, what can your competitors do? Uh -huh. And Yes, and uh, you, you talked about this a little bit before, but what was your transition from working startups to teaching like? All right, so first of all, for you know, the full disclosure, I didn't work startups all the time. I was, a, I was most, most of the time that I, before I was an educator, I was, uh, I, I, I was in some capacity with NASA, and ultimately a senior research scientist. Uh, mm -hmm. But I certainly worked for startups a few times. And so the transition was, First, I was, I was working at NASA, doing fine, but frankly, a little bored, a little, little uh, feeling like I wasn't mm -hmm. learning anything anymore. Um, and I wanted to do something that would push myself. And so a friend of mine who was part of a startup company invited me to join their company, and I, I did. Um, and of course, pretty quickly, the economy had big problems that were out of our control, and we went out of business because 
our product was good, but all of our customers went out of business. And so no matter how good your product, if you don't have any customers, you're going out of business too. Um, and so we did. Um, and so that left me kind of sitting at the kitchen table with my wife saying, well, what are we going to do? Cause I could have gone and searched and found a, another engineering job somewhere. Um, right. but the economy wasn't doing so well at the time. It would have been tricky for me to find a position that was, that was very enjoyable, very rewarding. Um, meanwhile, she was having a lot of success at work, but she was only working half time because she was prim the primary caregiver for our children. And so it's, the, the solution was pretty obvious. Have her go from half time to full time in a job she already loved and they already loved her. And, and then let me, I could, I, I might consult a little bit here and there, but mostly I would take care of the kids. And then uh, we, and we did that transition. And so I got to walk my children to school uh, for most of their elementary school career and well, pretty much all of their elementary school career. Um, and my daughter, my wife got to uh, uh, become a highly successful uh, Silicon Valley uh, technical leader. Uh, and so, so that now she's a print principal scientist at Adobe. And when was this period? That was in, was it in the early 2000s, uh, just before you started teaching? Yeah, so, so that transition happened. I don't remember exactly. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, like early 2002 when, uh, well, when I stopped working for the last startup company that I was uh, a full-time, fully paid employee for. There were a couple more startup companies that I worked for after that, but they never got, either did get big enough to, to pay me or they, or their arrangement was temporary enough that I wasn't an employee, but was just a consultant. But in any case, yeah, it was 2000, about 2002 that I uh, uh, went to becoming a uh, stay-at-home dad and mm -hmm. then took care of the kids and stuff and take care of the kids got easier as time went on. And so sometime around 2005 or so, I, or even earlier, I, I joined the co-op. Oh, actually, I ran for city council. I forgot about that. I ran for city council in the city of Mountain View in 2002. Lost. And oh. that was good because if you're on city council, it's really bad for your health. I mean, I think those people, uh, it's a big sacrifice just to, to sit, have to sit at, at those table, at the table in the front of the room for four hours, five hours, six hours every week or so. And it's just, you can just see them, see them. They just, I mean, as, as much as they take care of themselves, otherwise is you just look worse and worse if you're sitting up there like that. And so I was glad to not have become a city councilor and worked to support the community by joining the Kiwanis club and becoming the president of that organization and joining the PTA and becoming the president of that organization. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that took up that, covered about three years during which I sort of, well, or more than three years, at least three years, where I kind of went from interested in supporting the community to really involved in supporting the community um, and seeing where the need was and realizing that um, the, it seemed to me the biggest way I could make a difference that I would also find personally rewarding would be to, to be a teacher. Uh, and so I began that transition in 2008. Okay. Did you feel that there was anything that you've learned from your previous work that you were able to apply to working a, a, a teaching? Um, yes, um, but also no. Um, so the world of teaching and the world of engineering, the world of education and the world of science and engineering have very different cultures. Um, and that means that if you, it means that you have a, 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 an advantage because if, if you're a scientist or an engineer in terms of your understanding and training, mm -hmm. in terms of understanding how it is that new ideas come to actually work, um, and how is it that you get someone to come up with a good new idea? How is it that you get someone to, be, to, to work really hard, um, even though you don't, have any, you, don't have, you don't have grades to hold over their head? but instead you just have the ability to make them enthusiastic. And that's a, running, running, uh, running uh, volunteer organizations also helped in this regard. 
And so that, 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 that experience made it so that I, uh, relative to other teachers and with my level of experience, was able to quickly get students to do more ambitious things successfully. Um, it also produced complications, um, but, uh, but, but because the two worlds are, are so different, um, but that yeah there there were that that there was that kind of advantage of of really understanding what innovation is and how it works. Okay, I see. And moving on to this year, um, something that I also wanted to talk about is what were some of the things that you were doing to uh, for this year help students learn remotely, and how how is that different from previous years teaching at Pali because Traditionally, you would just uh, teach students uh, every two to three days in a, in a classroom for half, uh, one and a half hours, and now it's everything's moved online. What were some of the things that you were using? Yeah, well, um, so, so going, do, doing the transition, uh, I was a little lost at first. Uh, we, I think we as an organization, uh, the school and the district, a lost lost an opportunity when we saw the virus coming um and there were some some people who were sort of advocating for really trying to make it so that we could uh be ready for closure and there i think there was a lot of denial that closure would happen until suddenly closure happened um and so that made it so that that uh we i think we lost a lot of momentum in terms of what we could have done to get ready uh given that um i i was nevertheless able to kind of ultimately produce a set of comprehensive videos that covers the curriculum for all the computer science classes and for the engineering and cad classes i had to scale back it's kind of hard to know i mean how do you teach something which is fundamentally a hands-on activity when you're not can't, can't and fundamentally can't be physically present for uh with either with the materials for the students or to keep an eye on them for purposes of safety. Um, do it, teaching engineering was something that, uh, I mean, I now have some ideas for, but it will take some time to kind of get it together. And just coming up with it in the, in the moment was not something that I could think of how to do. Um, okay. And so I settled on creating some assessments for students to use in reference to a decent set of CAD videos I found. Mm -hmm. um, and and that made it so that at least they had something to kind of do to kind of learn about something systematic in some ways that might have actually been better for the for some of the students in that particular situation uh then then uh because it, it provided it sort of i got less ambitious with that class and sometimes when you get less ambitious with the class you actually cause this you're, the students are actually able to pick up more because you're just focusing on the basics right that makes sense so it was all kind of a very sudden process. Uh, it, it, it just suddenly, um, before you, you guys even started thinking about moving school to online, it just one day, it, it, you guys just are, are within a week, or when did you guys start planning to move school online for Pali? So um, at some point in time, uh, one of the teachers in my department sent an email off to the other teachers in the department and said, hey, why don't we get ready for the possibility of needing to close down? And I thought that was a great idea. And I said, well, okay, I'll do something to kind of start to prepare. And we'll, we'll uh, uh, actually have the students not come into the classroom for one day uh, and see what comes up. Because you cannot, this is one of the things I learned from industry, you cannot figure out how to do something new unless you actually do it. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Um, and the good news is if you're doing it while we're still meeting at the school, you can bring people back and talk about it and quickly kind of fix up the mistakes, the confusion that happened. Um, and for example, you yourself personally, I know you got confused about something about that day and we, yeah, sure. and we had to, we had to, and it was good that we could actually talk about it in person rather than you being off somewhere lost and not knowing what you were supposed to do. Uh, we, 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 we kind of got that fixed up. 
Mm -hmm. um, and but but never but but because the school well here's the thing. There's leadership in times of crisis, and there's leaderships when there's not crisis, and those and they're two different kinds of leadership, and it's difficult to function as a leader in a crisis if your style is or or organizationally function in in a time of a crisis when your organization is organized around sort of more routine day to day activities um, and so the routine day to day question of what rules are we following with with respect to uh online learning the rule there, there were a set of rules that uh to do what i was trying to do we couldn't follow and so my, my attitude was hey it's a pandemic let's well we gotta we've gotta uh adjust to it but there was the, 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 there was a little bit of a i would say a, a lack of imagination in terms of how to address that problem until suddenly the school was closed and at that point it was like, oh well, now teach things online. It's like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Now it's now 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 it's a situation where you mm -hmm. you you you've lost a lot of you, you've lost a lot of time, a lot of opportunity. You can still do things, but it's 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 it, it's difficult uh, when you. One element of human motivation is that once you've had a responsibility taken away from you, it's hard to regain momentum. So yeah, that was. Uh -huh. Do you think there was any benefit to learning online? Was there anything that's good about it compared to just doing it face to face? Well, I think in a way, but in a way that's very expensive in terms of the, the harm to the students. It's sort of like saying, well, right. here's what we're going to do. We're going to make it so only five of your students can make it into the classroom and only your five best students to make it to the classroom. Well, guess what? Those five students are gonna get a better learning experience. And those, and so the students who typically I was able to reach out to and were able to reach out to me were students who were highly capable. And so it was more difficult to reach out to the students who, who were in more need of support because they would frequently be having, the reason they needed more support was typically because they were operating in more challenging circumstances from home. And so there's a strong correlation between these two things. And so the students who most need support aren't even getting anything. They're not asking for anything. You don't know what's going on. You're sending them an email and you don't get responses. And so those students, uh, because you, I mean, at a certain point you try to, to try to support them and you don't support, but, but, but you, but we haven't figured out how to do that. And so that's a huge cost. It's, it's a huge societal cost to give up on that. And then, there is a small silver lining, and that is, I have more time. <laughs> okay, I have more time for strong students. So a strong student sends me a question, right. I have the time to answer it fully. And for that, for me personally, it's, it's nice to be able to sit here and think about a problem and write up an answer and make a video about it. Huh. Um, and I can do that, and I don't get interrupted. I maybe I get emails, but those, I don't have to let those interrupt me, unlike in the classroom where students, people will be constantly interrupting you. And so the, the smaller level of interruptions has been uh, very pleasant for me in terms of my personal experience. But as I said, I think that that advantage comes at a huge price. Right. Um, so I'm, I, 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 I don't feel comfortable characterizing it as an advantage of going online. I would just call it more of a silver lining. Uh -huh. Yeah, that is a, um, ver a very valid concern because most of the time, if you have a student that's struggling and not really asking for help, and you're just sitting very close to the student inside of a classroom, you could just go up and ask the student how he's doing, he or she's doing, and uh, try to provide some help. But now everything's online. It's making it really hard to contact yeah yeah i mean even even in person it's difficult right even in person you you find yourself uh overlooking a student that who maybe you should pay more attention to uh, -huh. uh but at least they're there at least you you have some chance of of making the connection and uh then the, and there's also what, what what we call latency how long so if i see a student's having a problem mm -hmm. i'm going to understand that it is how significant the problem is within seconds. If I actually 
follow up with them in person. Within a few seconds, I'm going to know, oh, this student needs more follow up. On the other hand, if there's a student who I don't know what's going on with them, I send them an email, and then a day later, I get nothing back. Okay, it's been a day. Okay. And the yeah. amount of time between when I first suspect there's a problem and actually we can do something about it, that can drag on for a week or two or three. And the semester melts away and the student has lost the opportunity to be there. They're hopelessly behind in the class unless you adjust the class's standards. And so that's part of the reason why uh, the, there's, a, a, there's a big back off on, on, on the, the assignment requirements. And I, I'm, I've been extremely willing to push almost automatically. I will give extensions to people because uh, it's just not possible to be remotely fair. But there's another element of unfairness here where students who want to get a rigorous education they do, they, they do all the work to be on time, and then all these deadlines get pushed out another five weeks or something. What, what, what work are they going to have to do, and what's, what, what credit are they going to get in recognition for all the effort that they put in to get those assignments done on time? And so it's very difficult to be fair by almost any measure when you're in this situation. As time goes on, we might be able to figure out some me measures or mechanisms for making it more fair and making it more uh, at the same time rigorous, but just doing it off, uh, doing it ad hoc, doing it on the fly has been very difficult to to meet uh, meet all the interests that need to get served when you when you're doing education. So, do you think that the future of education is technology because a lot of the uh, a lot of both students and teachers are saying there are a lot of benefits to using online resources like for people that are not really that that don't traditionally have access to uh, resources um, they will be able to get more access online. I can't, I can't speak to the general situation. I know that in my personal experience, I've become more adept at making instructional videos for my students. And in the process, I have created a library of videos that I can now use in future classes. Those, that, that, that makes it so that I, I will be able to support online classes more readily in the future. Uh, and it makes it so that I'll be able to take advantage of technologies that, uh, that interface with an online experience more readily. Uh, so those are those are sort of positives. Um, and in terms of which technologies will make sense, I think that I mean, so so it has been possible to give some semblance of the current experience uh, all the way back to the late 1960s. Uh, and you could mail them to people and people could watch them and learn just as well as if you go on YouTube now and watch a video. And so the question is, well, what, what's in those 50 years since then, since this has been possible, what's diff what difference is there? And I would say there's very little difference. There is, and, and we have, but we have not seen this technology take strong hold in the world of education. And I would say the fundamental reason is that we still are not far enough along in terms of the what's called bandwidth and latency, the time it takes to get a response from a student, the amount of information that you can get about a student's situation and learning is still very small because you see them in 3D when they're in the classroom and there's a lot of detail of information about how a student is doing that ha doesn't have anything to do with what they're typing at the moment, okay? It has to do with their posture, it has to do with, um, what you put up on the walls in the classroom um and so i mean i guess i would say that 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 fact driven home to me reminds me of the need as a as teacher when i have a classroom how can i take advantage of it i'm going to be more mindful of, of taking a, more advantage of my, my classroom if and when i get one back um so but 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 until we're able to get the bandwidth for for communications higher uh and it, and cheaper uh, so that you can like project a whole scene on all your walls and make it so you really are immersed, have an immersive virtual reality experience, mm -hmm. then I don't think, I don't think technology is going to replace the classroom very effectively. Right. Okay. 
that makes sense. Oh, I, I was also curious about your thought on uh, your, your, your thoughts on programming as uh, sorry, teaching programming as a as a class because uh, many people are saying that we should instead of making high school students uh, take programming classes as an elective we should make it mandatory what do you think what do you think about that do you think um, that's something that we should do or not necessary because the students who need to learn computer science are often those who will avoid it. So that situation calls for a requirement. However, in my opinion, the, the best solution eliminates half of the current requirements and injects computer science more fully into math and laboratory science and engineering classes. And in this way, all students would get computer science through required courses, but enrollment of co pure computer science would be enhanced because students would have more room in their schedules. And I think that, that it would, the fundamental explanation I get for, for why students don't enroll in computer science is not because it's merely an elective, but because they don't have room to fit into their schedules. So I could, for, we could force them to have it in their schedules, but that would still make it the case that students would only take one semester and only do it and do it with a minimum of enthusiasm. And I'm not, I'm not happy about the idea of having students who are just there to get through the class. I, I uh -huh. far prefer to have students who want to take the class. Right, but almost, so, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, that's, I was just gonna say, it's difficult to predict, to predict the effect of a policy decision. And it's what, viable to make decisions in a, in a dynamic way that allows and expects a change in the requirements over time. I think it's hard though, because human nature tends to want a decision make it a requirement, don't make it a requirement, and then not change that. Uh, and I, I wish we were able to be more flexible. Uh, what if you change it to almost like a core class where you have uh, kind of the sim a similar as English, math, and, and the science sciences? You, you would have English, math, science, and programming. Right, so I think it, it goes back to the question of there's only so much time in the day and so if you're going to make it a requirement, you're going to have to either diminish the number of electives down to practically zero, or you're going to have to remove some other class from being a requirement. Um, and so which of those will work? Which of those is the best choice? Um, I don't know. Um, I think that there are so, so and, and I mean, I was on a computer science uh, advisory committee for the school district for three years, and we worked, we struggled to come up with uh, a good recommendation for the district and ultimately did recommend making computer science a requirement, at which point the district promptly decided not to take the advice. So I don't know what to recommend uh, at this point for the community um, uh, other than uh, what I said, which is sort of like, I, uh, I, I would, I would tend to go for, uh, I, I think it's difficult though, because the best can be the enemy of the good. I don't think we can re I can reasonably expect to have the requirements to be taken away. Um, uh, so we kind of have muddled forward a little bit by injecting a little bit of com more computer science into algebra. I think there's a boot program called bootstrap, which is part of, part of the algebra curriculum now. And I, I'm ha happy about that. And in terms of, like, again, what would I personally do? Um, I've had discussions with the administration for years now about the possibility of like teaching a physics class that has computer science incorporated into it. Because I'm, I'm credentialed personally in teaching physics as well as uh, mm -hmm. computer science and mathematics. So that's something that I, I, I would like be, I would love to explore, but there's a limit to how much time a given individual has. I'm kind of just, I, I can kind of do what I can do, but there's a limit to that too. Sure. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, if you, um, I think, I think if you think about the importance of other subjects that are, that people consider to be quite important nowadays, like English and science and uh, if you think about computer science, it might be 
some people are saying that it could be more important than science classes um, so that instead of having science, you, you still wouldn't completely eliminate science classes like chemistry or physics, but you would like do half of that or less than half and then replace it with computer science. Like, could be, that could be a possibility. I agree that that's one option that could be explored. I think, uh, I think that is a difficult decision. Uh, and you know, if I were, if you were to ask me for, I kind of have outlined kind of what I would most strongly recommend another alternative as someone who's taught geometry before, I think that geometry is an interesting topic because it's involves creating a, the, the sort of the pinnacle of geometry, which actually is often not even taught because it's so hard is doing formal proofs about geometry. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that if we, we, we could revamp a ge geometry curriculum so that it becomes very much programming in the same, it take a lot of thought to make it the same computational concepts, the same intellectual concepts that geometry teaches. So you'd still be teaching what a triangle is. You'd still be teaching side angle, side theorems and this sort of thing, but you would be delivering proofs would be proofs that get, got delivered would be code that students would write rather than, these oh. these long formally written proofs that are the teachers hate to grade and the students hate to create mm -hmm. if, if the, 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 what you're doing there as a student is you're trying to you're struggling to write code effectively so uh it, and the advantage is that the computer a computerized version of this writing code that corresponds to a proof is something that a computer can check the student the teacher doesn't have to even check it necessarily mm -hmm. and so the 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 bandwidth for learning is much higher in that context um and that's actually kind of been what i've been doing in developing the logic curriculum with stanford is where where you can create proofs um that that, that are that the proofs so the structure of a proof can be independent of the content for what geometric shapes are and stuff and so there's three concepts that then we can coordinate for how we would teach it there's coding, there's right, the formal logic proof, and then there's the, 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 the actual geometry content. And we could create, I, I envision one day creating a class that kind of combines those three things together. Um, one of the challenges is individual passions. When right. I talk to the logic experts, they, they bristle at the idea of coding. Right. Because a proof is a proof. I don't need I don't need code to write a proof. Uh -huh. And and at the same time though, they're using these computerized proof checkers. Uh, so it's not like they're just writing on paper. Uh, and a geometry teacher, I've been a geometry teacher, and there's a passion for the beauty of geometry and the connection between geometry and engineering uh, and science. And it's 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 sincerely present. Um, and so how you could craft a class that, uh, it, you'd have, again, there's only so much time in the day, you're right. going to have to give up something. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that would require that that's going to require looking in detail at the curriculum and making some difficult decisions about what you're going to get rid of, but also to be sufficiently informed to be able to make decisions that say, you know what, we may be throwing out the hinge theorem. That's a theorem in geometry. Okay. But right. students never, no one ever uses the hinge theorem in practice. And the conceptual foundation, the concept, concepts that are taught from learning the hinge theorem uh, would, be, would also be captured if we were to have students um, uh, write, this, write code that does this, this rendering activity uh, on a computer for graphics rendering. Um, that requires a lot of work and expertise at the detailed level. It's not something where you can just kind of wave your hand and say, oh, well, we'll replace geometry with computer science or right. we'll replace chemistry with computer science. You yeah. can't do it at that level. You have to go down into some details that are beyond a lot of people, especially people in the world of education, ironically enough, because we're talking right. about understanding technical material um, and um, not a lot of people in the world of education have a lot of technical expertise. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. 
So looks like I uh, ran out of questions. And, okay. Uh, just wondering if you have any uh, other thing that you probably want to talk about. Um, I didn't have any like uh, preset agenda. I'm I'm uh, delighted to be able to uh, interact with a student and support support you and in, in as you as you figure out how to navigate these waters. I know that um, mm -hmm. students. That, that, that you're in a, uh, and you may have been hearing how unique your situation is, and it is. Um, I, I can recall different times in my life when an event has happened and it has been described as unique. Um, and only after you get a little distance away from it in time, and you look back on it and you say, that was, that was unusual. <laughs> um, but often it doesn't seem that unusual in the moment. Um, and so, yeah, uh, uh -huh. I, I, I'm, it's a common temptation for, uh, teachers, especially this time of year where we're approaching graduation for, for, for seniors and you, you tend to want to give advice and, 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 um, the advice is usually pretty, uh, esoteric. Um, and the best advice I ever got from a teacher or an administrator was when the president of MIT advised us to be careful crossing the street. And, you know, that advice still applies. And so I, if, if, I, so if I were to add anything to any conversation with a student at this point in time, it'd be, be, care, be careful crossing the street. And, and, and it sounds mundane and it sounds, uh, I don't know, uh, not very, not very, uh, visionary, but, um, you know, you, you, each of you is really important, uh, and doing, doing little things like that actually are what makes a difference in, 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 the, in everyone's lives. So be careful crossing the street, eat your vegetables. Okay. That's great advice. Okay, yeah, I, just, I want to thank you again for coming on to the show. I know um, we've been planning on this for a while, and we weren't be able, uh, we wasn't able to do it in the media center because of the lockdown, but uh, if you're interested in coming to do the show again at the media center, then just feel free to contact me. And Sure, it'd be great to, to, to follow up or do, do, uh -huh. do another show at some point. I'd love to see the media center and... Uh, 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 it, it would be something of a celebration for us to be able to do that. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again. All right. Th th thank you, Brian. Take care now. Yeah. Take care. Have a good week. You too.